Ukraine dismissed this as a pathetic attempt at retaliation. A Russian bombardment of the port city of Odessa with drones and long-range missiles. Two warehouse workers were killed. An abandoned hotel smashed in what could have been an almost routine attack by Russia. But for this. Kiev now claims to have killed the commander of Russia's Black Sea fleet, Admiral Viktor Sokolov. Ukraine says it also killed another 33 Russian officers in the missile strike against the fleet headquarters in Sebastopol on Friday. The Ukrainians have targeted senior Russian officers throughout this war, often using intelligence from NATO. And specialist units have been tasked by Kiev with these killings. They're aimed at sapping morale and undermining command systems. CNN has no independent confirmation of Ukraine's claim to have killed Russia's admiral, but it would be its biggest success in this campaign. And part of an ongoing effort to break through Russia's defence lines to ultimately strike at Crimea. They've included earlier attacks on Putin's navy and a bridge to Russia itself. The first batch of US-donated Abrams tanks have now also arrived in Ukraine. But they're not the strategic weapons the Ukrainians say they need. Defense packages from the United States, including artillery, necessary shells, high Mars munitions, air defense missiles, additional air defense systems, tactical vehicles, and some other types of weapons that will prove themselves on the battlefield. Kyiv wants these attackums. Long-range missile systems to attack deep behind Russian lines to kill more officers and destroy logistics hubs. The US has yet to announce that Ukraine will get these missiles before the winter freezes over the front lines where they are. Now, of course, uh, from the Ukrainian perspective, without air dominance, breaking through those defence lines are extremely difficult. So a great deal, Pamela, of their main effort is focused on breaking what the military calls C2, the command and control, the discipline of Russian troops. And that's why they want those attackums, because they believe that if those missiles can kill enough key Russians, the Russian military will collapse in on itself, sparing bloodshed on both sides. All right, Sam Kiley, thanks so much for that. And joining us now from the White House, the National Security Council Coordinator for Strategic Communications, John Kirby. Thanks for joining us. So Ukraine, as we know, as Sam just laid out, says this Russian attack on Odessa is revenge for Friday's strike on Crimea. If Ukraine did, in fact, kill the commander of Russia's Black Sea Fleet, how big of a blow would that be to Vladimir Putin? That would be a significant blow, certainly to uh, Russian naval operations in the Black Sea area. And they have been very, very active for the last 18 months from the Black Sea, striking inside Ukraine from ships at sea. So if you're able to uh, uh, kill uh, the commander of the fleet or a lot of his or her staff, uh, obviously that's going to have a, a significant impact on their ability, as Sam says right in his reporting, uh, to command and control that fleet. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to be some sort of permanent fix, Pamela. They'll, they'll replace those people. Obviously, they'll put a new leader in. Uh, and the Russian fleet's not going anywhere out of the Black Sea. But for a while, it will have a significant impact on their ability to operate. So to follow up on that, can the U.S. confirm whether this commander was in fact killed along with 33 other Russian officers, as Ukraine says? No, we cannot. We've seen the reporting on that, but we're not in a position to, to confirm it. All right, so how far did these repeated Ukrainian attacks on occupied Crimea go in disrupting Russia's fight on the front line? I think it's important if you just look at the map and look geographically, Crimea is, is critical for Russia's efforts to continue its occupation uh, north of Crimea, north of that peninsula, and then up uh, the eastern side of the country into the Donbass. Crimea acts as a bit of a, uh, a staging ground, not just for attacks from the Black Sea, but also to be able to help uh, replenish uh, and resource uh, their troops, particularly in the southern part of Ukraine. So it makes perfect sense that Ukraine would want to hit strategic targets inside Crimea to try to hamper their ability to use Crimea as a staging base, if you will, for supporting their troops further inland. President Zelensky, for his part, says the first American Abrams tanks have now arrived in Ukraine. What does that mean for the counteroffensive? 
This is the first tranche of the Abrams tanks. These are very capable armored tanks uh, that can have a, a particularly uh, significant impact on the battlefield. Uh, but they're only the first tranche uh, of the more than 30 that the United States has committed uh, to Ukraine. There will be more flowing in here in, uh, in coming weeks. Now, obviously, it'll be up to President Zelensky and his generals to figure out how they use these tanks. They have other tanks from other countries that they're using. Uh, but in this fight, in this counteroffensive, where they are making steady but slow progress, particularly uh, in, in the South, uh, these sophisticated Abrams tanks, they, they can be, a, they can be a, a significant help. There are also reports that the U.S. will provide Ukraine with longer range attack missiles. Is that the case? And did President Biden make that commitment when he met with President Zelensky last week? I don't have any announcements on these ATACMs. These are long-range cruise missiles uh, to speak to today. What I can speak to is the fact that we are continually in conversation with the Ukrainians about their needs, including air defense needs. Uh, and as you saw, the president, uh, when he, after he met with President Zelensky, announced yet another tranche of security assistance, some additional arms and equipment. Uh, we're going to keep that coming. All right, before we let you go, I want to ask you about a potential government shutdown. The Pentagon has warned that a government shutdown could disrupt the delivery of military aid to Ukraine. How is the administration planning to handle that possibility? We've got a little bit more funding to, to go, so I, I think we'll be okay uh, for the next uh, few weeks or so. Uh, but uh, without the supplemental request that we asked for, uh, it will absolutely have an effect on our ability to support Ukraine well into the fall and into the winter months, Pamela. And look, I mean, the weather's not going to be all that cooperative here soon. You heard from Sam, you know, once we get into the winter, uh, it gets really hard for both uh, militaries to maneuver uh, and to operate. And so we want to make sure that we're getting them everything they need here uh, while they still have good conditions on the ground. Not getting that supplemental request if there's a shutdown, that's going to have a significant impact on their uh, on their ability to succeed on the battlefield. Yeah, and you talk about uh, the winter. Ukraine says it's going to keep fighting. Uh, through the winter. What do you think that looks like? Well, I think it'll look like last winter, un unfortunately. Now we're heading into uh, another winter of war. Uh, but it's it, last winter, both sides, did, they did fight. They didn't stop. Nobody just sat down. But the fighting gets greatly affected by the weather conditions, as it does anywhere around the world. Uh, and so it's going to have an effect on them. And we want to make sure that they can take advantage uh, of the good conditions that they have now for as long as they can. All right, John Kirby, thanks so much. You bet.